Okay. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Euro uh, European Geological uh, Data Infrastructure Session. My name is Robert Thomas. I'm from GRC, from Inspire team, and I have the pleasure to chair this session. Um, I don't know how many of you have, have been present to the, to the plenary session where the Executive Secretary of the Eurojo Surveys introduced the, the wonderful achievement of the European Geological Data Infrastructure Portal. Um, so I think we all are now in expectation you know, what, what it is actually all about. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Laszlo Seres from the Ge Geological and Geophysical Institute of Hungary, and he will give us presentation about the geophysical layers uh, inside the EGDI. Please, Laszlo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my speech first, I will position geophysics in INSPIRE, and I will give you the obligatory and the optional uh, feature types or feature subtypes that we have to provide in INSPIRE. Then I will give a short introduction of EGDI. Then I will present two use cases, one from Hungary and another one from uh, Denmark. The first one will be a resistivity data set the second one is a subset of uh, Danish seismic lines. Uh, finally, we'll get my uh, conclusions, and if I still have time, I will give you, uh, tell you about the future plans. Not going into the details, uh, this is uh, the geophysical data model, actually a part of the geophysical data model. Geophysics is positioned in uh, the uh, Annex 2 ge uh, geology uh, theme. Uh, as you can see, everything comes from sampling feature, which means that uh, what we provide in geophysics uh, is, is a very close connection to observations and measurements. Actually, everything, uh, each uh, geophysical features are some kind of sampling features. Uh, we are going to use the OM schema uh, heavily. This is different, a little bit different from geology. In Inspire, geology uh, do not use the OM. It's geosciema still that is connected to OM. Uh, so here is a geophysical measurement, a kind of ge geophysical object. And you can see that it, it's classified by geometry, meaning that we can have uh, point measurements, uh, curve geometry measurement and surface measurements. These will be geophysical stations, profiles, and geophysical swaths or surface or area measurements. We also have a bunch of code lists that uh, connect the uh, traditional geophysical terms that are used in, the, in our domain uh, to the INSPIRE features. Uh, of course, you can check those code lists in the INSPIRE code list register. But if you go to the codeless register, you will see that uh, some items are labeled as legal, some items are labeled as technical level. Uh, items that are legal are part of the obligatory data provisioning. So this is a list of obligatory feature types in, ge in the geophysics layer. Uh, of course, it's again uh, divided into three parts, or four parts actually. Stations, profiles, surface measurements, and campaigns, or surveys, and these are the list of uh, traditional geophysical data names or data types, measurement types that are obligatory to provide as INSPIRE services. Uh, of course, we have millions of gravity stations, magnetic stations. Uh, the obligation is only for uh, gravity magnetic uh, seismological observatories, so the essential stations, and the first, second order base stations that makes part of the national uh, uh, gravity or, or uh, magnetic networks, seismological networks. We also have some essential measurements like MT, uh, DC soundings. And of course, we have the seismic line here, uh, borehole logging, very important, and 3D seismics. If we want to 
provide data about the geophysical surveys, then we can use the airborne uh, ground gravity, ground magnetic seismological survey uh, feature types or subtypes. Uh, of course, there is a deadline for all this, and the bad news is that it has expired one year ago. So it's time to start to do something. EGDI can help in it, of course. This is a list of uh, optional geophysical methods. Uh, there are all kinds of geophysical methods. Of course, you can add more. If you want to add more, if you have something that there is not in the list, then you just use the same geophysical data model and extend the code list with the new name, with the new parameters. Uh, this year, on the 14th of June, uh, Eurogeo Surveys has launched EGDI version 1. That was a very successful event. And uh, the website itself is a beautiful one. It has very nice features and wonderful harmonized European data sets. That all comes from uh, former or previous uh, European uh, projects. All this was done as a voluntary contribution of the member organizations with no financial support. It was an investment to the future. Uh, just a few words about the background infrastructure. Uh, let's say this is the EGDI portal. When the user interacts with the portal, usually he gets information from the EGDI central database. Everything from the former projects was uploaded to the central database, either by harvesting or by uh, diffusion. But uh, when we go to geophysics, the situation is a little bit different. We have two more players. Uh, one is the Hungarian Geological Survey, and the other is Gauss, the Danish Geological Survey. We both have our own databases. And in the preparatory phase of uh, the EGDI project, the EGDI bridge project, we uh, completely restructured previously existing uh, metadata uh, from the Geomind project. It's a sub subset of uh, all the data that uh, can be found in Geomind. And it was uploaded to the Hungarian server here. And uh, the same was done with a limited set of uh, seismic clients from Denmark. About 200 seismic clients were converted into Inspire features and uploaded to the Hungarian server. And uh, if the user asks for geophysical data, then uh, the portal will connect to the uh, Inspire service. And as a WFS uh, service, he will get uh, the geophysical layers. If the user selects a feature from, the, from a, a set of uh, features on the map, then you can uh, download the feature metadata and you can investigate. And in the uh, observation measurement section, in the related measurements result, there's an em embedded uh, link to downloads. And if he activates the download, then he will get uh, seismic data directly from Gauss uh, database, free of charge. Gauss offers all these 200 seismic lines free of charge for download. This is, uh, uh, this is very nice and it's a very valuable data set. Uh, let's speak about the uh, uh, use cases. Use case one is a resistivity data set from Hungary. Actually, the northwest uh, uh, border of Hungary and the southwest border of Slovakia in the Danube area. This was a joint, uh, uh, this is a joint uh, cross-border data set. Uh, it's very nice for uh, groundwater research and also for locating occurrences of uh, mining aggregates. Uh, we are talking about this uh, nice uh, map. And if you want to have the background information, you can download the location map of the uh, original soundings. Uh, the other use case is uh, the 200 seismic lines from Denmark. It's, of course, it's a multi-purpose data set, but best used for groundwater exploration is it's quite shallow. And it comes from the Gerda of uh, uh, Gauss. Here is uh, the first map. Uh, we have a specific widget for geophysics, but now I show you some uh, metadata search. I just entered resistivity here, 
click on the button, get the list of services, select a layer, and I get the map in the map viewer. This is uh, a nice colored map. It shows uh, conductive and resistive areas, which means rich and bad aquifers. The red areas are coincident with rich aquifers. Lots of water in the ground, okay? If you are a service company and you want to know more about the data, you can go to the original data set. You see the locations of the uh, original measurements. These are the vertical electric soundings. And you can see that uh, we have soundings in Hungary and we have soundings in, in the Slovakian area. And all is Inspire compliant form, so metadata can be accessed the same, very same way. Uh, We have some uh, beautiful features in the map viewer. Uh, for example, we can do filtering based on Inspire uh, feature attributes, namely expiration depth here. So here, uh, all, only those features are selected that have less uh, uh, expiration depth uh, than 1,000 uh, meters. You can zoom in and select features, and uh, the system will come up with uh, Result set. You can see in a small table the basic uh, Inspire feature attributes, and you can also activate a, a download link. If you activate this link, then you will get the data from Hungary, and you can see uh, core traders and HTML, the Inspire uh, attributes. The first part is uh, the generic uh, geophysical station attributes. Uh, so, facial metadata or very basic metadata. And then you can go to the observation measurements uh, part. Uh, you can see the uh, data acquisition parameters, the process parameters here. We also have a link for Inspire uh, XML download, so you can check the Inspire XMLs. Actually, these are validated against the schema, so you can take them as a good example to create uh, valid uh, geophysical data in Inspire. The second uh, use case, the seismic lines from Denmark. If you, if you click on the, this widget to the seismics, the map viewer will pop up with this map. You can uh, zoom in it and then do the same. Zoom in, select uh, some profiles. You get the very same uh, kind of uh, table with the very same attributes, only the uh, station type or uh, the type is different. It's seismic line now, it was before vertical electric sounding, and you have the download link, you activate the download, and you see the geophysical profiles attributes, and you see the observation metadata. This is the seismic data acquisition parameters here, streamer length, active channels, source type, everything, what is important for geophysic geophysicists, and we have uh, time stacking, uh, processing, and time migration. You can even check the uh, uh, header from the SEG Wi-Fi, but we, what we really want to do is to download the seismic uh, data free of charge from GEMS. And you have a beautiful seismic line in your computer, and we have a happy user. Well, uh, conclusions. We have implemented uh, view services in EGDI, uh, we can uh, uh, see, investigate maps, location maps of geophysical information, and we can also uh, download Inspire feature metadata, and looking through the Inspire metadata, going through the observation section, we can identify uh, download links that uh, brings us to the download sites. Uh, this link can be a free download or it can be behind a protected service, doesn't matter. The main point is that you have access to the data. I haven't talked about discovery services. This is a very important part, of course, but in the next presentation, Dana will give you an introduction of the EGDI metadata catalog and uh, uh, future plans. Uh, we, we want to add more layers to uh, the geophysics part of EGDI, at least the obligatory ones. It's not a small job, but uh, it can be done. Uh, another big issue, a, 
a big challenge is to implement the geophysics schema and the observation and measurement schema in uh, EGDI. So uh, central harvesting uh, will be possible and uh, we will be able to receive uh, data from or harvest data from other data providers. If we want to add uh, more data providers of course and more data and we would like to replace the old GeoMind uh, metadata catalog that is an outdated uh, pre-inspired uh, data set and uh, we can, uh, as you have seen, we can do uh, the restructuring and uh, provide a service through EGDI. And uh, of course we want to make uh, geophysical information available to external clients like uh, EPOS or Copernicus or uh, whatever uh, external projects. Well, I think that's all. Thank you for the attention and you can see the portal on this website. Thank you very much, Laszlo. Um, we have time for one or two questions to Laszlo. No questions. Everything was clear. I, I, I have a question, or maybe I should have said before, that if you are complaining about the complexity of the geophysical data model under the geological data team, this is the guy that did it, okay? So, so actually he's now demonstrating that it, it is feasible to use his model, you know, to provide harmonized uh, geophysical data across Europe. <laughs> okay. Thank, you, Thank very you very much once again. Last one. And I would like to introduce uh, Dana Čápová with pleasure because Dana is my former colleague and she will give us a presentation about the discovery part of the EGDR portal. Thank you, Robert. I just have to find it. Okay, good afternoon. My presentation will not be so exciting because it's about metadata. And as you all know, metadata is the most boring part of all the story, but the essential part. Without that, we hardly can find the data services. Um, it's a home address of uh, any of these beautiful information. So I will uh, again talk about the same story, EGDI, European Geological Data Infrastructure, from the metadata point of view, why it's been done, what we did, how it was done, how it follows the INSPIRE rules, and few more information about what next. So EGDI, uh, or EGDI bridge, how we call this uh, prototype, the uh, first version of the system we have developed in, f in the first six months of this year. It was uh, developed as an initiative, funded uh, completely from internal resources of the Czech Geological Survey, I mean this uh, metadata catalog development. There was no external financing sources. I hope we will be in a better position in the future. So this metadata catalog, as we call MITSCA, is based on the previous development from uh, other projects like Minerals for You or even before One Geology Europe. Now uh, this system was rebuilt, perfectioned, and very much further developed to be compliant with new INSPIRE rules and to follow the needs of the EGDI project. Uh, this functional prototype example uh, has three primary functions to demonstrate the harvesting technology because it's the preferred strategy to harvest from original national resources, 
to demonstrate the editing capabilities. It means uh, all the metadata can be entered and managed using this tool. And uh, the most important thing I will demonstrate is the connection to the portal. It means the practical use of metadata as a link or information about the services provided on the portal. So our ambition is to create a system that will be a central hub for geological data of Europe. And uh, of course, it can be under certain conditions used as an information source for other domains activities like uh, EPOS, GEOS, others. So this is a front page of the metadata catalog. Uh, it's, um, it has uh, all the typical uh, search uh, facilities and uh, functions. I would just uh, show you this one, harvested from, because this is something that was not uh, used in a previous versions, and it's very important. So you can demonstrate that the data are, some data are coming from previously uh, uh, finished projects. So it's important to know the link where the metadata or data services come from. So we can search metadata uh, using this quite sophisticated tool. And uh, what you see is just a simple list. It means a name of the service or data set. Uh, if it is followed with already a known icon of EGDI, you know it's uh, part of this uh, EGDI development. Plus, it's uh, shown the abstract to know what is it about. You can see also some of these icons with uh, functions like a link to the portal, I will demonstrate later, or other possibilities, just to show quickly the uh, authorized version. It means uh, for authorized users, there are much more uh, possibilities, much more tools to manage the data, to show and to validate for inspire rules and so on. So we can select one of these uh, metadata records. I have selected the uh, One Geology Pan-European Surface Geology. We can uh, see the complete uh, or a basic metadata list following the standards. And there are important functions. For instance, if you close this magnifier button or just use the resource locator, you can link directly to the EGDI portal or any other portals available so the same service can be reused for different projects, portals for any use. And we are redirected directly to the EGDI portal. So you can see this uh, beautiful geological map of Europe in the new version with the already well-known logo of one geology. This service I selected is the new version of the One Geology Europe service uh, developed by most of the surveys uh, first half of this year and it is or should be Inspire compliant. I think more details will be presented later by Tim. But what is important, if you select the same service from the portal, uh, you need to know what you are looking for, how it's been done, how to find more information again to go back to metadata. So this icon can uh, show you the title and abstract displayed directly online from our EGDI metadata catalog using this icon, 
you can uh, read full report from EGDI metadata catalog. And so we are back in the metadata uh, report. So the way there and back again, like Hobbit, what is important, so you can go either from the side of metadata to search, browse, find a service you are interested in, display it on the portal, or the other way around, start from the portal, find the service uh, you are interested in, and find the metadata. Just quickly, what's on the metadata catalog? Uh, results of the previous European projects been mentioned before and will be presented some of them again. Uh, plus data sets related to these uh, services. And uh, of course, uh, we have included as a test, as a demonstration, some important data sets and services according to the participating geological services priorities. And of course, there is possibility to describe the applications enabling address, uh, access to some of these data and services. The basic rule is everything what's displayed on the portal should be supplemented by metadata. So we always know what's displayed and who to contact if we need more information. So briefly, basic information. Uh, of course, the main principle was to follow the standards. So it's fully compliant with Inspire, Dublin Core, our well-known ASOS 19115 and 19119. What is uh, slightly different from previous developments is the language, because now the metadata catalog is just bilingual. Uh, previous, some of previous catalogs had the uh, ambition to be multilingual now the situation is slightly changing, so it supported the national language, what is the rule of Inspire plus English as our common language. Uh, just mentioned the keywords, so new Inspire URIs uh, should be used, plus some specific uh, keywords, for instance, the uh, abbreviations of the projects that are included. Uh, we faced also some problems because the name of the organization and name of the country are not uh, precisely specified in the Inspire strategy. So we made some proposals that will be probably further discussed in the future because it's very important if you are selected something. This is uh, quite confusing if we use different standards. Harvesting is a key how to prevent us from duplicating the work. So the preferred workflow is uh, to maintain and keep up to date metadata in a national catalog and uh, harvest them directly uh, to the uh, EGDI metadata catalog is the easiest way how to keep the records up to date. Uh, there are very precisely specified guidelines for harvesting. I do not want to go too deeply into details. So what we have up to now in the metadata catalog? Uh, we have 18 data providers uh, supporting the EGDI metadata catalog and providing uh, metadata listed in here. Altogether, we have 1987 records of these. Some are still not made public. So 1973 public records, mostly data sets, but also uh, 147 services. But it's quite a good number. Uh, mostly uh, coming from the previous European project mentioned before, plus uh, applications. And uh, to follow the rules I mentioned in previous slides, harvesting, so we are 
we have set up harvesting from 14 catalogs. Vision, what next? There are a lot of conditions we want to see clarified, but the ambition of this development is to become a central geological data hub for uh, serving the future European Geological Service. And uh, what we would very much like is a sustainable platform for results of uh, already finished ongoing or future European geoscientific projects and information resource for other domains that is very much requested. And of course, all this action exercise was a live demonstration of implementation of INSPIRE principles. So you can come find a way to the metadata catalog of EGDI, try the prototype, and uh, we will welcome your comments and additional ideas. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, is there any question related to metadata? Yes? Can you speak up, please? I try again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wonder whether you, uh, what is your vision about the, the, the interaction between the Inspire portal and the metadata catalog that you are pushing forward for, for the geologic team, in fact, because every uh, country has to fulfill the obligations for Inspire. So at the end, all metadata should already be in the Inspire portal. And yet there will be another portal for the geology only. So what is the relation? OK. Of course, uh, Inspire is a law. And EGDI is just uh, our uh, geological domain project or initiative activity. So all the national data must be described by metadata following the INSPIRE rule, following the law. Uh, that's one reason why we prefer this strategy of harvesting. So usually the National Geological Survey is filling uh, metadata either into their national metadata catalog or directly to the INSPIRE catalog. And the same uh, metadata record uh, should be uh, harvested by our EGDI metadata catalog, which is much wider going, much farther than just Inspire specifications and Inspire rules. If it's answer for your question. OK, thank you very much, Dana, once again. Okay, the next presenter is uh, Lola Boguera from the Cartographic and Geological Institute of Catalonia, and she's going to talk about the first uh, Inspire compliant geological data model. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Dolores Boquera Ferreiro from Institute Cartographic and Geologic of Catalonia. I'm a geologist with field work experience, and I present the interoperability of geological data, first ICGC, SPAR, Complaint Geological Data Model. Next 15 minutes, I'll talk about our institution 
Institut Cartogràfic and Geològic of Catalunya, what is our challenge, why SPIRE is an opportunity for us. Before start modeling, we begin from several assumptions, the workflow we follow to get the conceptual model, how we face the problems, which is the result obtained, what lesson we have learned, and what is the next. Well, the Institute Cartographic and Geologic de Catalunya is the official Catalan mapping and geological agency belonging to the Catalan government and aiming to deliver to user valued geographic and geological information and service. ICGC, it was founded in 1982, developed institutional and commercial activity. It's responsible for multidisciplinary aspect on geomatics and geology. As in other geological surveys occur, in the ICGC geological information is stored in multiple geological production databases for royal oriented. Its geological map series has a specific data model and database are mainly oriented for maps production. production. As a result, geological information are not inter interoperable. Our challenge is to design a single geological UML model is per complaint to create a special data repository for storage and management of the ICGC geological data sets. In addition to get more interoperable and harmonize it, the geological data sets has to be able to produce maps and other geologic information products. So it's for us. SPIRE represents an excellent, an excellent opportunity to fill the gap between multiple representation models to a single geologic object-oriented data model. Before we start modeling, we begin from several assumptions. The first assumption is for extracting the geological information from a geologic, uh, a geologic map and to interpret this information in a conceptual UML model, establish relations uh, between classes, attributes, regional and field, geology experience is necessary. The other assumption is that the, uh, um, the geological information resolution is related with the graphical scale. For that, we consider as a geological collection its geologic map series. We can observe for a given area how the geologic information resolution increases with the graphical scale. So, in order to store and manage more efficiently and make the geological information interoperable, we start build the conceptual geologic model for the geological collection 250,000, taking as a core the SPIRE geology model. And we consider it as a base for de developing the model for bigger scale. We can observe the geology inspired model is the core of our geological conceptual model. So the workflow we follow to get the geological conceptual model is the toilet study, information extractions, problems and solutions, and results. And finally, the results we obtain it. The first step is a detailed study of inspired data specification on geology, the future catalog with classes that ties and attributes definitions with the aim to understand better the inspired UML class diagrams. The inspired code leaks in the next C and for, for data model public station, the Geosize ML 3.2. Encoding cookbook for SPIRE recommended in the Annex D. 
on the document of data specification. Also, we analysis the application schemas on the web, the geosizable models, and the CGI, CGI sorry, vocabularies used in geosizable uh, models. The second step is extraction information. Extraction information containing in the published maps of geological collection. Sorry, I don't know why. The, the, we, we extract the geological information containing in the published maps of geological collection 250,000 that are geologic map and structural map of Catalonia. Both of them provide a comprehensive and synthetic view of Catalonia's geology. The most important feature types included in Spire geology model, like a geologic unit, uh, bore hole, shared displacement future, faults, were identified in the published maps. However, the future from the class described the land force, natural geomorphology unit, are not identified in the geologic map of Catalonia because in this kind of maps are not, are not usually represented this future. But we found this informa information partially implicit in the quaternary geologic unit descriptions. So the geologic problems begin. We differentiate, differentiate four kinds of geologic problems. Implicit geological information to avoid information loss, terms equivalency, and the geochronologic time scale correlation. Some geologic information <clears throat> required by inspired data, data specification, as I mentioned above, are not always evident in the published maps as well as natural geomorphologic filter, the data type composition part associated to the geologic unit class and geologic event class about geologic history. However, applying spare geologic criteria, we found this implicit information in other sources. Geologic unit description and other bibliographic reference, like regional studies and mainly Alder Geologic of Catalonia. So regional geological knowledge is, a, is, is again required. On the other hand, there's geological information represented in the published map, but that is not included in the inspired geology model. So following the recommendation in the data specification document, we adapt customized extension from geosizmal and new attributes in order to satisfy all requirements for our organization. So the, th the third problem, geologic problem, is the equivalences of geological terms. We try, to, we try to find the best equivalences between ICGC geologic terms and inspired terms and CGI vocabularies, but not always fit. So if any equivalency can be established, we propose an, a new term to be added to the inspired codelites or CGI vocabularies. The last problem, geologic problem, we find is in Spire, is necessary to provide geologic age spreadsheet using a geochronologic time scale defined for ICS, International Stratigraphic Commission. But the geologic time scale are not statics. For the geologic collection 250,000, was used an older version of time scale. To solve this problem, we study the relations between some time scales by taking the name 
of the era instead of that of the state leads to a loss of information. But this will be improved, and so we hope, <laughs> when we model bigger scale geological collection. And finally, the results. <laughs> Once designing the conceptual UML model as an inspired customized it, we work in the world together with an expert of UML modeling. And we generate an application scheme, a schema, inspired complaint, and future catalog using the enterprise architect software. And edit a data specification of 250,000 geological collection. A multidisciplinary team is crucial. So what lessons we have learned? Implanting Spire is an excellent, uh, is an excellent opportunity to fill the gap between multiple representation models to a single geological object-oriented data model. To avoid information losses, it's essential to focus on data concepts, not only in technology. The benefits of close cooperation between experts in different fields, basically, basically geologists, data modelers, with sim similarities to the work of inspired thematic working groups for data specification. And what's the next? We are going to model the geologic collection 50,000 taking as a core the geologic collection 250,000 UML model. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm so quickly. No, no. <laughs> very quickly so answer. One question. Is there a question from the audience? If not, I have a question. Uh, are you planning to publish the data that you, you nicely modeled your internal database now? So are you planning to publish it? Are you planning to set up the services that the other users can use it, your, your data? Yes, in the future. To to load the data, and, but before we are thinking to model the bigger geological collection, mm -hmm. 50,000 geological collection, and yes, it's <laughs> one of the... <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a uh, not question, but uh, I saw uh, you met some uh, um, problems with uh, compliance between uh, CGI uh, code lists and uh, and Inspire ones, and uh, it's rather for you. Um, <laughs> we met the same situation in. Uh, uh, with uh, metadata catalog, etc., and uh, I would like to open some discussion um, if Inspire uh, rather than uh, maintain their own code lists for these geological items uh, to adopt uh, the whole CGI or uh, uh, do some logic how to maintain uh, this uh, code list together. Thank you. Yes, the answer is yes. The, the CGI code list and the Inspire code list, they have been harmonized. The Inspire code list are using fully the CGI code list and the URIs are there linked together. So, so this is the solution that, of course, if the community has such a, such a maturity in terms of the SDI, so like the... the the vocabularies then, of course, Inspire should be reusing that, not to developing and storing and managing you know, their own codes. That's clear. Thank you very much.
The next presenter is Tim Duffy from the British Geological Survey, and he's going to tell us experience of making all the One Geology Europe services Inspire compliant. Good afternoon. Testing, testing. I know I speak loudly, but I do need some help here, especially with the noise coming from next door. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Duffy, and I have a rather long title. And we made this rather long title to, to keep Robert happy, because Robert happens to be the one responsible at JRC for running the thematic clusters. But I'm going to talk today about one of the data sets that is, was launched with the EGDI on June the 14th. And I have a lot of co-presenters here, which I'll talk about later, um, because this is a pan-European project. OK. Between the years 2007 and 2010, as you've heard earlier, there was an FP7-funded project called One Geology Europe, which began to harmonize data for various topics, including surface geology, across Europe. It didn't, uh, which is the light there? It didn't finish the job, but it was a very good example of moving towards that. And what it did do was it created a lot of knowledge and experience that fed into the Inspire Geology data specification. It was pre-Inspire. And what the EGDI decided for June the 14th was to try and recreate this data, but in an Inspire compliance data set and service as pan-European as possible because it identified a use case, a usefulness, for this particular data set, which is one to one million surface geology. And there it is, you've already been shown off it, in the new, brand new EGDI portal. The key thing about this is, it took advantage of the harmonization effort that took place in the One Geology Europe project. It was able to take advantage of it, very considerably, and so it is harmonized data and, as an and f actually the first example of a data set that pan-European that is really Inspire compliant because it is both technically compliant, but its data has been classified and harmonized according to Inspire classifications or code lists. Here is part of the data set zoomed into. We have classified this data with age and lithology using the Inspire code list, and we've combined the data set. If we do that, that means that when we click on the map and we get a link to a code, here's the link to a code, representative lithology, we actually resolve right through to the Inspire registry. Now, you just had a very interesting comment. You didn't know I was going to present on this. But these Inspire codes are exact matches to CGI codes. CGI code lists are sometimes the same as or supersets of the Inspire codes. At the moment, we will link through to the Inspire codes, but actually we have the developing capability to link through to the CGI codes if you wish, and for the expanded code lists. But here we have live a real example of a data set containing hundreds and thousands of Inspire spatial objects which are classified according to Inspire code lists, which is a first, at least in the geology domain. This means that we can have artifacts like this legend, which is actually following the Inspire definitions and colors, and these artifacts did not exist before this EGDI bridge project. Many of you out there will have read the Inspire data specifications, and you will realize that they, are, they contain what we in English call TPDs, to be decided, both implicitly and sometimes explicitly. And this is not just true of Earth Science TGs. This is true across all the themes. I've read them all. But here we have an example of the first time of artifacts now available to us that are available to be used on, not just for this data set, but further on for geology for Inspire. Here is the uh, age one. And we, are, we have provided um, SLDs for coloring up web map services, 
and we will also be providing them in Esri styles for those people who need and want to use commercial software to um, do this sort of thing. So, the question about code lists. Now, I'm only showing two, two slides today which computers should read and humans shouldn't read. And this is one of them. But in fact, this slide is humans, geologists, do have to read this sort of thing. Because on the right-hand column, we've got the Inspire, supposedly language neutral. OK, I'm lucky. They're sort of English-like because they give you a hint what they're about. We have the Inspire URIs, which are being used. And these had to be mapped in this conversion project to the old things in the left-hand column here, which were created in 2008, which were actually URNs, they were not URIs, from the CGI. The middle column shows how the CGI moved on to, developing, to adopting this new technology of URIs. The point I'm making is the data sets we were using, by and large, were a good six years old but they were still considered to be worth using and valid as long as they could be converted to being Inspire compliant. And because, as ever with CGI, we were ahead of the game, and the reason we were ahead of the game is we've been working on these interoperability standards since 2003, again, a good four years before Inspire was a twinkle in certain people's eyes, because we have the data populated with this, we found a way of helping people to convert very easily, almost at the push of a button, to the Inspire URIs. We could do that. During the One Geology Europe project, when the data, the spatial objects, were classified with these CGI codes, these URNs, some organizations spent hundreds of thousands of euros doing that process. It's a lot of geologists' staff time. Everybody knows, whether they're in the earth science domain or any of the other 33 domains in, in Inspire, the harmonization process is the thing that takes time and costs us. And because 2020 is approaching, we are now moving fast towards that. Through this project, we were able to take advantage of the prototype harmonization there, and we found a way of supporting very easily getting to Inspire codes. We did this through the mediation and of the Inspire Earth Science Thematic Cluster. Now, the Inspire Earth Science Thematic Cluster is run by the Eurogeo surveys on behalf of everybody with geology data in Inspire. And I want to make the point, as you always should do at, Insp at Inspire conferences, <laughs> Eurogeo surveys runs this because they represent perhaps 95% of the data providers that mandatorily need to be provided for Inspire. But 95% is not 100%. There are other people out there, not in Eurogeo surveys, who may have to provide Inspire data in this process. And if they do, they should contact the thematic cluster and join in. So it's a non-inclusive club. There are nine clusters covering the 34 topics in Inspire. They share experience, best practice, and discuss things and come to conclusions and provide facilities to allow people to do projects like this. Uh, the Earth Science Cluster has 169 members. That's almost the biggest one already. And the point is, we be able to get at those people who should be in interacting with this cluster uh, because we are Eurogeo survey members. But it's the people we don't get at, but particularly wanting to hear from. And if Amelia doesn't mind me asking her to stand up, um, my colleague Amelia here is the facilitator for this cluster and would love to hear from anybody who has not already been interacting with the cluster uh, to join this group so it is well beyond just Eurogeoscience members, Eurogeoservice members. So in this particular project, 17 um, Euro uh, European Geological Surveys used the cluster and cookbooks and information that we provided on the cluster to convert their services so they could become part of this new EGDI pan-European one to one million surface geology data set that was really was Inspire compliant in every true meaning of the word. On that cluster, we published cookbooks, we updated cookbooks, we published Excel spreadsheets, we discussed issues, 
and we did it and we offered a helpline through this system through One Geology. You've heard that One Geology was the predecessor of um, uh, the, the earlier project. That One Geology itself has managed to continue and has provided a lot of the experience and support for this. There's an example of a cookbook created by One Geology, but in fact the key point about it says if you follow the Inspire specific instructions described within this text, you will also have an Inspire compliant web feature service. So we made sure that everything here showed people how to create an Inspire compliant service. We organized webinars, and we also found through this six month, was it, was it only six months, it felt like 10 years, project, we also found that some of these code lists you've talked about had typographical errors in them. Um, that is a result of people actually, more than one person, actually using these code lists. So the Inspire registry actually edited um, 18 of those values, 18 of, of the 425 values were edited and put back on the registry so they could be used just in time for the project. And I've got news for Robert, that was 18 changes and yesterday the Eurogeo service approved just one more. <laughs> and it's just a topographic. So we'll be getting back to you through the formal process. But the point about it is all domains in Europe were asked to check these code lists two years ago or something. But did anybody really check them? People only find problems with code lists when they actually use them. So here's an example of a project that has actually fed back and done that, and the registry has been accepted. So that's really positive. And this slide is just to show, notice the 418 views, that's very satisfying, um, that we have updated what we've learned from that. Um, and now if you use these cookbooks, they're even better than they were previously. And on that point, some of you I know were desperate to use Esri software for this. We couldn't use Esri software for the web feature service for this. But we have, I've spent most of this, con our first half of this conference working with Esri. In the future, we should be able to use our Esri software to do this complex stuff. And it's not their fault, by the way, they're having problems with all the domains. And really their problems are what I said earlier. Technical guidance doesn't go down to the detail of actually doing things and often has to be decided from domains. So we decided a few things and they work. So here's one of the individual services. It happens to be from Slovenia. And it's in the One Geology Global Portal, which happens to have tool tools which will allow you to do real nice Inspire queries both for the web map service and for the web feature service. Um, so that's an individual service which is available in the One Geology portal and more of those individual services from each country will be added there. Um, again, you can see the portal and this comes back to the question, brilliant question in the middle, I didn't know was coming. That portal can handle CGI code lists or Inspire code lists. The point about it is they are exact matches and we will make sure Robert and, uh, and us will make sure they are never think anything else than exact matches. So that process is in, 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 in process and is working well. So we handle that and it works. Now this is the second slide that shouldn't be read by humans. It's harvesting in SPAR compliant download web feature services version 2 to a pan-European in SPAR data set. Those countries which were able to complete in time with a very short data set a fully compliant web feature service, we were actually able to use that to create this combined data set. Okay? And we did it with a OGC standard web feature service request. So I'm not going to go through line by line what this says. I'm going to tell you what this code represents. What it represents is it did a query of country X web feature service and country Y web feature service. And because they were highly interoperable Inspire services, and only because they were highly interoperable services, the data could be brought together, combined with 16 other countries, and it works. Okay? One little point down here, the very last line, it asks for the projection system, EPSG 3034. Why does it ask that? Well, in fact, the different data services were not harmonized according to the projection they were in. But because we're using standard tools to ask queries of data, we were able to ask projection X and projection Y, and please return it from the web feature service in the European ETRS 89 uh, two-dimensional projection that we decided was suitable, Inspire legislation was suitable for a one-to-one -one million surface geology data set. 
So that little piece down there is an example of what in previous INSPIRE conferences has often been talked about, where are the transformation services? On the fly, the data was transformed to the required European projection. And the pleasing thing for me was, it worked. <laughs> Which is not always the case when you're using these OGC standards. Okay. So we had 16 data providers. Not everybody had a web service for the full WFS. We got a table dump from some of them. That's fine. Over time, they will create their Inspire compliant individual web feature services. And those data, according to that query, were combined into a central data set, which has created a single web map service of this particular data set for the EGDI website. Um, and that's really, and so the individual services that were uh, created are fully Inspire compliant. Uh, I like this slide, by the way. I stole it from Jurgen there. He's going to he's going to show it again, but he was, he's named on as, as a contributor here. So, the central database is all classified according to the Inspire code list, and the web map service here, in fact, the web map service here can be described as an, a fully compliant Inspire compliant web map service, just the web map service. So, to finish, I'm going to thank you for your attention, and I'm going to bring your attention to these names here, there's a lot of people technically involved between France, Slovenia, and of course, 17 geological surveys, at least 17. There's a couple more who are going to come on stream in, 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 in the autumn. The point about these staff, too, too many to mention, is through this process, we've taken advantage of the EGDI bridge, bridge project to let people in the geological earth science domain take a leap forward into learning how to create Inspire compliant web services. Okay, they've gone a leap forward. They've gone through the pain. They've taken advantage of data that was part harmonized already, and they've a leap forward. So if we move on to other data sets at other scales, such as bedrock or faults, that I know the Irish want to do, want to do et cetera, et cetera, they, what they then have to do, they will find, is not a lot more than what they've already done. They've, they, the, the staff involved have learned. So we've had a capacity building in the Eurogeo service domain for Inspire, getting us well prepared for the fast approaching 2020 deadlines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim, for your very entertaining presentation and clear. Do we have questions to Tim? Yes, please. Hello, I have one Hello. question. Uh, what are the main uh, lighthouse projects uh, where the one to one million geological data are Sorry, used? Can you, can you put it onto your, uh, straight onto your mouth like that? Okay, can yeah. you hear me? Now I can hear you. Yeah. So my question again, um, what are the main projects, the lighthouse projects where the uh, geological data on, in the scale of one to one to million is used or are used? Because uh, Geology matters, that's clear, but uh, many uh, questions can be answered only in a bigger scale. Yeah, bigger scale. Um, and I would like to know where, which are the, the projects where your data is used. The use case for this particular date, this scale of data set was identified, and in fact, I think my next speaker, or in the next two talks, is going to refer to the use cases for the data sets that were converted. There are fewer use cases, you are right, for this low-level re resolution data than there will be for more detailed data. But as we've heard from our ICGN colleague and et cetera, et cetera, we're all moving on for Inspire to publishing data sets that are 50K scale, 250K scale, and they will have greater uses. So I'm going to pass that one on to the use case talks, which are in the next two, uh, next two talks, I think. Okay. Thank you. We have to continue. So the next presenter is Jürgen Tostrup from the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. And he's going to tell us about the EGDI and how EGDI can be used uh, in various use cases. So that would be probably the answer to your, to your question. Yes, here it is. So, um, 
thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I will speak about EGGI again, as we have been doing in uh, several of the other presentations. Uh, in particular, this time, um, I will talk about integration, uh, how um, a, a portal like EGGI is designed in a way so it's easy to integrate and be used by different user groups. Um, I mentioned the engineering company, but this, what we talk about will, can be applied for, for many other, I hope, this, it will be obvious. Uh, a little bit of background about EGGI. You have had several presentations, so I will go very quickly through this. Talk a little bit about the, how it's it built up, the architecture of the system, uh, and then focus mainly on how to integrate um, other uses into using it and uh, give an example of that. So um, the background was that the Eurogeo surveys actually has a strategy of establishing a thing like EDDI uh, to uh, be able to serve the, the needs of the European system, first of all, uh, but also to, to be able to serve the, uh, you could say, the wider communities around. Um, we had a project, uh, EU co-funded FP7 project called EDDI Scope in 2012 to 14 where we, uh, one of the main um, really, um, you could say, maybe scaring outcomes of the, the project was that we've been running a lot of projects through time, uh, developing um, or making data available, harmonizing data in the ge geological domain. Um, more than 80 projects were identified the, the total project sum is several hundred million euros, but only very few of them are sustain, sustained today. And this is really the background of, of making EDDI now. Um, these, these are the topics, uh, the, uh, the themes that they are located in. So we had this uh, EDDI scope project and we really talked a lot with the, the stakeholders about how should we set up something to sustain these, these uh, uh, very, very valuable data that has been produced. So we had a description of what to do in, already in 2014, but uh, we didn't, not until this year, we uh, have been establishing EGDI based on the findings of the, the CGDI scope project. Uh, but now we, we have, uh, have made it and um, you have seen uh, different uses of it during uh, today. Um, so this is the, the basis for what, what uh, we are working on now. It's, it's a first version of an EGGI. Uh, it's by no means complete. There are a lot of things that m can be uh, done to make it more useful and um, uh, valuable, but uh, we have now something which is a, a fundament for it. As I said, there was a large stakeholder involvement. Maybe not so much from private companies. Um, the, the main focus has been to serve the, the European system. But as I will talk about now, we think it's quite relevant also for private companies to, to use the platform as it is. Uh, this is a very, very conceptual picture of uh, EGGI now. We have uh, at the bottom here some different providers of data and services, national geological service organizations, but also research institutes, universities, and so on, feeding data into EGGI, and then the EGGI, by building this platform and making data available in a harmonized and homogeneous way, enables other users and also other initiatives and platforms and programs to, to make use of these data. And uh, of course, an in, in important way that this is achieved is by living up to inspire standards as far as we can. This is the same picture that uh, Tim showed before. So we, very quickly, we have these. This is the overall idea of uh, having data down here and 
for certain data sets in EDGI, they are harvested into a central database, not all of them are. But on the way of doing this, we are actually uh, helping the, the data providers to, to get their data ready in Inspire compliant format so they also live up to the legislation. So this is the portal that you probably have seen, but I'll now go in a little more detail about where different things fit into it and how it can be useful in different ways. Um, it's overall, it's built up by a, a menu over here. Here is shown the full menu and over here is the map area, very standard GIS, WebGIS functionality. Um, we, we do, we, we have built up, set up this. We, in, in, uh, in other cases, we, we uh, show this same view, but with a limited uh, menu. And this is something that can be utilized also by other people who want to take advantage of the system. But if we just put that one up here, I'll just show you how different ways of providing data to EGGI fits in with this, um, this uh, view of the, the portal. The geological surveys, again, are providing data. In some cases, and this is the mostly integrated way of, of using EGGI, the, the data are then harvested, not only the metadata, but the data themselves are harvested put into a central database. That's the case for the map uh, Tim talked about. It's also the case for some uh, mineral data that we, we already have from a previous project. Then we have integrated into the system uh, uh, a catalog actually defining what, what is available here. The data that you can just by know, knowing nothing about uh, data themselves, but just referring to is it, uh, is it the minerals, is it uh, surface geology, is it marine geology, is it geophysics, and so on. So this catalog up here takes care of all this, makes this, this menu uh, possible. And once that's the case, data can then be shown on the map from the central database. But that's another way is that people just um, that could be uh, anyone. It could also be a geological survey, survey but it could also be anyone, uh, many other service providers, and we have access to data from a lot of other service providers. Uh, they may also be registered in this catalog, thereby making them accessible in the menu. So you can still just click on them, find them very easily by your own natural language, you could say. And once that's in place, their data can be shown here. Another way is through the Mitchka that Dana talked about. Once people register a service here, they will be without being entered into this catalog. There's, they're readily available here because we have a search option down into the Mitchka catalog as Dana showed. So once you do that, you're ready to be able to be exposed on the portal. And the final thing, even without doing this, uh, you can search for any uh, random uh, WFS or uh, WMS that uh, you know the address of, uh, because there is a search facility for that also. So these are the different ways you can get your data to be shown here. So again, if you just have a WMS, if you know of a WMS, your own or someone else's, you can show it, and you can even have the legends displayed through the MISCA data catalog, and more integrated directly in the portal if you're registered in the system. Um, one thing which is quite nice is that you can, you, can uh, you, you saw the menu before, which is very comprehensive. But it's very easy to, to make other views using the whole functionality of the system, but limiting the uh, menu to what you are interested in. So you can then integrate it. Just put an, uh, if you have your own website, you can just integrate uh, um, in, in an iframe in your own company website uh, 
the full functionality of, EG, of the EGGI uh, with all the GIS functionality and then select a few layers that is of interest to you. So you don't have all this noise of minerals if you're not interested in minerals. You, you just see, in this case, uh, hydrological data. And very easily, because this, uh, of course, here's the whole website of EGGI, but this small picture here is something which can be, can be integrated in your own website without all the surrounding EGGI menu things. Another thing, I'll just, Dana did show it, but I think it's really nice functionality that we have this two-way integration between the Mitska data catalog, uh, metadata catalog and the portal. Here you can see search metadata catalog. I just entered boreholes. Then I get a list of different data sets in the Mitska data catalog which are tagged with being a borehole data set. BGS has some, they actually have some site investigation reports that very easily shown here. So again, you don't need to know um, other than your own natural language, you could say, to search these things. The other way around, as Dan also showed, you can search here the full normal uh, ISO uh, metadata um, functionality, searching for all these uh, usual things, and then you can click back and whoopty up on the map comes this is water wells from the UK somewhere. Uh, so it's, I think we're making um, the metadata more useful in this way because it's so easy to, to uh, get, them, get to them and get them shown on maps. Um, and this is something not to be read by humans, as uh, Tim says, but it's actually the, the map I showed before includes hidden almost, the, the, uh, the name of the server and the address of this uh, service that I showed before, meaning you can just, if you have a few clever people at your organization, they can, they can build this for you, they can integrate this into your website, including the, the link to where these data are. Even though they are completely unknown in the beginning to the system, it could also be another uh, WMS that you just found and is useful for you. So you can integrate data that are already known by EGGI with whatever you want, and uh, the, your user don't need to know anything about it. It's, it's done by you, by your clever IT person. So. Uh, this uh, engineering company that uh, I talked about, they are uh, preparing for some uh, upgrades of the railway uh, system in Denmark. So they themselves have been out and uh, acquiring a lot of data. Uh, we worked together with them and put them in, this, the, in, the, in the menu. Now we are focusing, as you can see, on those data only. So they don't need to all this other EGGI stuff. Uh, but it takes a few hours to put it into the system and make it available like this. So they have some boreholes and they have some reports along the railway lines. Um, and here is their data zoomed in. You can see along this they have a lot of information. But what they need also is what is else out there. And in the EGGI system now we don't have information about boreholes along railway lines, but they, uh, they just search the metadata catalog and finds that, that uh, there are some Danish boreholes available, of course, in, um, we have it in Denmark, so they, uh, they choose this and, and up comes on top of their other data, all these and the, the, the brown ones are really the ones of relevance for them. So they can very easily, in this picture, and also zoomed out to whatever they want, they can integrate in their own uh, application, their own website, their own uh, tool for the engineers who are going to work here. Um, and then they will have access to their own data as well as some other data that they found. Um, so this is, uh, this of course could be combined with anything else from EGGI also, but they don't need that for the moment. So that was what they, they liked, and um, it's, it's working for them. So that was an example. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jürgen. But since you have another presentation immediately now, so I think that maybe we can store the questions after your second okay. presentation. Okay, so please continue with the second. Yes, I see if I can find it. Uh, where do I end this? to get this to get away. Yeah. So this one is actually a presentation uh, prepared by Michael Peterson, who was very much involved in uh, building the GGI uh, system also this spring. So I hope I can answer questions if there are any. But, um, so this is uh, again about EGGI and, and the special use, you could say, of the system. Uh, just like the other one was how can it be used for companies who want to integrate. This is uh, some thoughts we have about how to um, support innovation based on the system that we have. First, uh, we want to tell our, our view what what do we mean by innovation? And uh, then something about who are the, um, our target groups for EGGI. Um, the current expo exploitation ex potential and uh, how um, this can be strengthened. So um, in our view and, and for this presentation, what we mean by exploitation is that uh, we, we, we have to be, we, it's, it, it's, it's nice to implement things, it's nice to, uh, as, as we are here, to, to have all these things available, but the real value comes, in this case, when someone, on basis of this data, is capable of pro, um, uh, produce something that meet, needs real user needs. Um, we, it, it's not enough to have a, a, a good use case if it's not used. It must be used, and it must also be made into may, could be made into some products that that is uh, useful for people. So, as I said before, when we've been talking about EGGI in the past and the the ways we defined uh, the requirements for EGGI, it was very much focused on policymakers at European scale. Uh, local regional authorities, researchers, to some degree also general public, not so much, but first of all up here. We haven't had that much focus on, on industry and how they could utilize the system, but we believe there is a great potential there anyway. They have some other needs. They may maybe have needs for data at other scales than we have been working on now, if we go back to the question from before. Uh, they probably need that data free and reliable, of course, yeah, high resolution, downloadable maybe. They, they just want to find the data to download them. And what will they get out of this? Yeah, this is what we, what we uh, feel or are quite sure this, this is uh, the, the benefits that comes out of, of these data being used by this uh, user category. Already now, we have, as you probably have heard, all the, a lot of geological data available. That's far more than has been possible before at the European scale. We have further a lot more um, from in the Michigan data catalog, which are not harmonized, but they are available from the national level. We have this new functionality, nice filtering and uh, search facilities. and. Uh, we are able to do these thematic maps and target different user groups using the same infrastructure but focusing on what they are interested in. 
how did we approach this? Um, in two ways, actually. We have been, as I said before, mapping all this huge amount of information that's available from, from other projects previously. And that in itself is very much and very interesting, but in itself doesn't necessarily need uh, you, uh, meet the needs of uh, the users we talk about here. So we also were looking the other way from, from top to down, uh, where we have been had a more uh, use case oriented approach um, and defined a number of use cases. Some of them are then um, implemented in, in the, the, the portal as it is now. The portal can be extended a lot, but now we are demonstrating different, different kinds of uses that we think could be relevant uh, in, in many cases. One of them is the one that uh, Laszlo talked about here before, geophysical data in Hungary, but some of the others are, of course, known. Um, it's not something that we make up. It's, 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 it's known uh, use cases that we, in the EGGI, demonstrate how we can serve them. So doing that, that has an impact on the data and service architecture. I will talk a little bit more about that. We do see some challenges uh, from having this approach when we uh, look at uh, the Inspire principles. Um, in some of the, some of it's, it's not it's something about Inspire, but we, we, we do see some some difficulties in a truly distributed architecture, which is otherwise uh, many advantages. But we do see some uh, challenges there. And we have therefore, as we already talked about several times, been working much with these uh, harvesting uh, mechanisms. An example that we defined, an archaeologist, archaeologist wants to find sandstone occurrences in Europe. Uh, we have a data set, the nice data set that Tim talked about. Uh, we also have another, we, the data coming from another source about sandstone, the, the minerals for EU, uh, where there's uh, data about uh, uh, mineral occurrences. Some of them could be of sandstone. We do have um, harvested some of these into the central node as a um, uh, the, the central database beneath this. The challenges turned out to be when we just say, we just, just like we said before, we just like a person to say boreholes. Find, give me everything which has to do with boreholes, even though it's maybe in the, data, in the metadata not called boreholes. So we have uh, a challenge there. In the same case, if we just say we want sandstone, so what is sandstone? Yeah, many of these terms here actually do refer to sandstones, but we don't have a, an overarching uh, uh, concept of the sandstones. Um, when we go to the, that was from the, from the Inspire code list, when we talk about the deposits in minerals for EU, they are talking often about aggregates, and that could be sandstone, that could be, but could be also be other things. Uh, if we want to filter using a, a, a filtering on the WMS service, you can filter on one parameter at a time, making this difficult. Filtering on a WFS service, our experience is it has some problems in uh, performance. So it, it was a very down to basic thing. Uh, we actually uh, had this um, database that were available and we, we know how it's structured and these, I mean, making this query, finding these, these um, uh, features that are, should be, could be called sandstone was much easier to do with this old fashioned te uh, technique of uh, simply querying a database with SQL. Thank you. Um, here's what it looks like. Um, on the geological map, we have some. On the mineral currents map, 
some others that these are on the surface. These might not be on the surface, so it, we don't, it's not necessarily a problem that they don't overlap, but, but you can see here down the relatively um, um, complex uh, uh, query that we have to, to formulate to get these out because the data is stored in the way they are. But it's possible, but provided we have uh, built it up with the harvesting as we did. So, user satisfaction is not necessarily guaranteed by Inspire compliance. It's a step and it's necessary, but it, we, in some cases we need to do certain tricks. Um, if you want to exploit the potential of these to, to really consider the user's needs is extremely important. So, if we want to extend the uh, innovation potential we must take this into account and we must really have focus on the user needs. And we must know that the industrial users have other requirements. Um, so we need to balance the, 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 where we put our uh, effort. As we said before, easy and efficient access to data is absolutely crucial. We, we see GGI as a one-stop shop, so it should be easy and fast. If we find some, when we find some way of, uh, um, some way of reliable con uh, sustaining this, this is also a requirement, of course. Data must be free, otherwise you, you stop there. You must go to high resolution and download is probably also an issue in many cases. So, we think that use cases with high innovation potential for the industry are possible using the EGI portal. You can already do this. You can search for what this is. You can filter. You can, in some cases, download, but not in every. That's not something that's done in general. And you don't have an easy way to just put everything in the basket. That's something which would be nice. Just shop around and take all these data sets. It's now relatively inhomogeneous the way you can get to the data. And then some other things that we might think could be could help. Um, especially working with more scales and uh, all uh, more harmonization, of course, is needed. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Okay, so we've been through two presentations about EGDR and its potential. So, any questions, any thoughts, comments? Do you agree that there is a potential? Okay, yes. Uh, we could see the, the advances with the harvesting from your last example, uh, but what, was the, what did you think about when you chose harvesting instead of direct access from the geological service around Europe? But, but why we do it, uh, or when we do it, and when we don't, is that what you say? I was thinking if you thought about uh, not harvesting, but going directly to the VFSs of the geological service around Europe, and why you made the choice of harvesting, uh, you kind of answered it <laughs> in yep. your last example, but were there any other specific uh, things that led you to that decision? It, it, um, there are... One of them is definitely the, the um, uh, availability of the services, which we simply realize is not always there. So uh, the experience is that, that if you say you want to access 20, 25 geological services, there, was, there will very often be one of, or two not up and running. Uh, this may not be that big a problem if you're looking at a map because you can see that 
whichever country it is, is not there. But if you want to, to um, do some aggregation of data, if you want to make, for instance, uh, the minerals data where you might ask the question how much, uh, how many occurrences or what is the amount of such and such uh, based on a summation of, of uh, the, the data in a lot of services you won't necessarily be aware that some of them are not there. And you will get, simply get a wrong result without you can see it. So this is, this is one thing. Another thing is it works much, much faster. If you have, have this data set in one, one place and just have to ask that one server, it's simply much, much faster. So in some cases, this is what we've done. But the, at ETGI, there are a lot of data sets which are not harvested. Uh, so, but that's mainly data sets that are already pan-European existing someplace. So you could say it's harvested to somewhere else. So, so, so we, we, we don't currently have examples where you go out and ask all these different nodes. It's, it's um, the experiences, it's principally, in principle, it's, it's good and sh the way it should be done because you know it's the latest up-to-date version and so on. But in practical life, it's, it, uh, it works much better, the other one. Okay, any other question, comment? Yes, please. Here, in front. Um, when you harvest the data, it's only a technical integration of the data. There is no harmonization on data level like edge matching or something like this. The harvesting process in itself is just a pure technical exercise. So the data needs to be harmonized uh, before that. And that, of course, is a challenge. Um, but when we, talk about that, when we talk about the map, Tim t told very much about that. This is very much about... Uh, the semantic harmonization and having the same data model and then the geometric harmonization at the, the borders and so on. When we talk about the minerals, uh, mineral occurrences that we also have harvested, the real challenge has been to, to meet the requirements of the data model, which has been difficult for people because everybody has their own mineral occurrence database structured the way they uh, needed it five years ago or whatever, and the, the data model of Inspire in this area is very complex, so, but that had to be done before. So it, we, we don't have any automatic things doing this, unfortunately. Another command, you have shown uh, the use case um, where you ask uh, for sandstone occurrences, and uh, you have shown that you have the problem that in the code list there are up to 10 or 12 other values which are related to sandstone and it's not clear uh, whether it's sandstone or not. That's uh, one, the, the main reason is that the code lists of Inspire are flat tables and in, sometimes in many cases in local uh, data models you have hierarchy levels. So you can aggregate on this uh, uh, higher level all this related uh, values for sandstone. And this is the reason why it doesn't work uh, in the Inspire data model. Yeah, I, I'm, yes, I, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, was, so was one? more question? We are well into the coffee break, so... <laughs> okay, if not, then I would like to conclude by saying that uh, well, I would like to congratulate this community because I think what we've seen is a, is a big success and big achievement in our field. This is the first thing. The, the, the other thing I would like to highlight the, 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 let's say, promotion and sharing of your experiences. You know, the technical ones, also the data management ones, the semantic. I think that other communities can really learn from your experience. So use the thematic cluster and other platforms for sharing your experience, please.